And we thank you and we praise you for so many who have made that kind of commitment with their lives for us and for our nation. Help us to remember and never to forget. Lord, we look to you as the absolute model of one who sacrificed for all. Thank you for your great love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hope that Memorial Day, which is tomorrow, that you take a little time when you get with family and friends and take a moment to remember all how the Lord has blessed you and all that he's done for you and, and all those who've spent their lives, literally, for our nation to give us the kind of freedoms that we have. Heard an interesting statistic yesterday that said that uh, the recent wars of uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, Kuwait, all that's going on in there, that the uh, majority of those who've given their lives in battle come from the great state of Texas. So Texas has paid a pretty big price for our freedoms. Thank God for Texans. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. And thank God for our military. We've been in this series on the miracle of Jesus, and I really, you know, that this message today is one that just captures my heart and excites me. If I'm a little hoarse, it's because I was yelling with so much excitement this morning at the other campus when we preached the early service. And uh, in fact, I was so excited, I just left my sermon notes over there. But I'm sure we can get through it anyway, amen, because they're pretty much on the board anyway. But uh, if we get into this message, this is number 10 in our series on, uh, on the miracles of Jesus. And of course, understand, these are just the recorded miracles. There were so many miracles that were going on, uh, the Bible says it couldn't, couldn't write them all down. And all the incidents and all the, the things that the Lord Jesus and the, the way he displayed his majesty and his power and his glory and his love, his compassion for everyone. Men, women, children, you know, Gentiles, outcasts, the lepers. I mean, you, we just see the Lord Jesus moving. And, and I hope that uh, throughout this series, at least the, you know, 10 messages now, you get a little glimpse of the great grace of which Jesus moved and operated with in his earthly ministry. We're talking about the Lamb of Glory, the Son of God steps out of heaven. We talk about this message today. It's certainly, I think, a, a needed message and an important message. We're talking about the, 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 the storm that was calm and Jesus was in the boat with the disciples and he was asleep and you're probably familiar. We'll read from you in just a moment. But to capture it from each one of these just a, a little bit, uh, we've said that they're all within a... You know, there's all a lesson from each one. Not only do we see the, the miraculous, and another testimony of the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ and of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is the Son of God. But with each one of them, we also see, you know, this, that, that there's a lesson, there's, there's, a, there's a message for us in every miracle that's there. So there's a spiritual application as well as the physical evidences of the, the glory of God manifest in Jesus Christ, his son. So we see the great power demonstrated, but we also see there's something for us. And when we get into Matthew 8, in just a moment, you can open your Bible there if you like, but in Matthew 8, Jesus is speaking, and again, we always talk about the context of these miracles. He's speaking to a group of people, and he's talking about discipleship and following him. And, and as he speaks to the group, there's people begin to make excuses. You're probably familiar with the past. Well, you know, I've just bought some property. I hadn't seen it yet. Well, what kind of investment is that? <laughs> so that guy didn't have a lot going on to start with, did he? Or I've got to do this, or I've got to bury somebody. And Jesus talked about let the dead bury the dead. You know, he's basically saying it's time to follow. It's time to follow. It's time to come after me, come after me. And then it starts off, you know, remember there's not chapter and verses that are there for our, our, our clarity and our understanding. It says, and when Jesus got in his boat, his disciples followed him. Now, that's a good test if you're really a disciple or not. You're following. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, and, and the boat was being covered with waves. But Jesus himself was asleep. And they came to him, and they woke him, saying, Save your Lord, save us, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, men of little faith? And he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and it became perfectly calm. These men were amazed and, and they said, what kind of man is this that even the winds and the sea would obey him? 
What kind of man is this? Now, this, people look at this. I've, I've heard uh, different kind of ideas about the context of the story and why the storm and what was going on and what was the purpose of the storm, you know. And, and the first thing, you know, that uh, it, the first theory is, well, it came purely by, by natural causes. I, I believe the Sea of Galilee is about eight miles by 13 miles. I mean, it, it's really not a sea. It's because it's so big they call it a sea. But it's really a lake, all right. And there's this giant lake there, and it's surrounded by mountains on every side. And a lot of these storms just come up naturally, and it's not uncommon for them to happen. And they don't happen with a lot, of warm, a lot of warning. The cool air off the mountain comes down and meets that warm air rising off the Sea of Galilee, and you can get some monstrous storms just in, in, in an instant. Everything just breaks out. And a lot of people say, well, that's just a storm and Jesus dealt with it. Another theory is, you know, it came by, by special and divine purposes, that there was something that the Lord Jesus was wanting to teach the group and something he wanted to hear. Third one was it came by satanic interference. The first one has to do with the fact, just the weather. Storms happen in life, right? This storm happened. Some people say, well, it was there because the Lord is trying to teach the disciples a greater lesson and they need to understand about faith and believing him. Third group kind of holds the theory, well, there was this satanic intervention because uh, the devil doesn't want Jesus manifesting his glory and he wants him dead. He doesn't want him to, to accomplish his mission. And again, we use that word context. Remember the story starts out with discipleship and when they get to the other side, in the context, the first thing that happens is, is, I think the King James Version calls it the maniac at the gatherings. I call him somebody in Houston traffic at five o'clock. You know, they're just out of their mind, all right? They're just crazy. He's running around, he's naked, he's cutting himself with stones. He can't, nobody can help him because he won't be, he won't be settled down or calmed down. And he's running and living amongst the tombs. And so, some people believe, well, the theory is here that the devil throws a storm in to keep Jesus from having the encounter to deliver this man of all these, this legion of demons that's in him. Now, whether one, two, or three is, is reality or all three, that's not the, really the, the crux of the, of the story here. The crux of the story is that adversities, storms arise in life. And I think what the Lord wants us to see today is, you know, that there's, there's several things that we can capture here. Is one, that there is a storm and storms do come, all right? But not only storms do come, most of the storms we encounter, like this one, were beyond any human capacity, all right? When the storm comes, there's nothing you can do about it. You just ride it out. And when those storms hit Oklahoma, when Ike and all these Katrina and all these hurricanes, there's not a lot you can do about it from a human perspective. In fact, there's nothing you can do about it. They happen. They're going to come. And they happen when we don't want them to happen. The third thing here is, is that the Lord is bigger than the storms. And we'll talk about that in a moment. He calm the storm. The fourth and last thing is, there's obviously lessons that the Lord is showing. Because Jesus is not moving and speaking in his ministry without goal, all right, without clarity, without a name. Just as we don't get up and preach the word without a goal. We don't... We don't just kind of have Bible studies without an aim. Our goal is to become more like Christ. The aim is for God to do something deeper in our lives, to bring fullness, to bring character to our lives, that we have, we have God moving in our midst. So uh, if we look at these, first of all, let me just talk to you about the storm. And the word in the Greek is the word seismos, when it talks about this storm. In other words, in fact, it's a word which we use the word seismic from, you know, like reading the earthquakes and things that happen, the seismographs, any type, type of term related to, 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 to seismic comes from this Greek word, which literally means to shake something. It's like taking this glass of water and just shaking it, you know, until it just begins to pour over the edges. And it's just, it's just, it, it has come down on the lake and it's just troubling it. And so it's being shaken from the very bottom up almost. And it's, it, it's a big storm, in other words. In fact, one, one of the uh, writers of the gospel says, and behold, you know, like, but it, it, it's a big storm comes. And it is literally shaking everything. And it's a bad storm. It's a real storm. In fact, it's so bad that the, uh, the wind and the waves are pouring over the boat and the wind's just picking the water up and carrying in the boat and, and they're about to die. I mean, it's, it's a real deal. It's a bad deal. I don't know if you've ever been in a storm like that. I, I was out in, in East Bay in Galveston one day in a storm like that. It just came up out of nowhere, one of these little summer thunderbusters. It just came up. We lost everything in the boat. It got so bad, everything in the boat washed out of the boat. That's how much water was coming into the boat. Next time, and ever since then, I've watched the news and the weather. <laughs> but it was just washed out, you know, and, and I'm thinking, you know, you know, praise the Lord, this boat 
hull is filled with styrofoam. So I know we're not going to completely sink, all right? If it rolls over, I can cling to the other side. But it was scary. I mean, it, it, scary is not a good word. Frightening is the right, is the right word for it. So this is actually happening in this particular story. It is a seismic type of storm. Behold, a big storm comes, you know, and it, it's, it's, in fact, it's so bad. Mark explains like this. The waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Now, it's all right when you're in the boat and you're on the sea, but it's not all right when you're in the boat and in the sea at the same time. You know, when the boat's in the sea, you got trouble. It's all right for the boat to be in the sea, but when the sea is in the boat, then problems arise and you got issues and you got problems. And this is exactly where they were. It's a real storm. The worst of the storm is there's no off button. There's no way to, there's no way to pilot your way through this storm. It's so bad that they are in fear of their lives. Now, before you take that lightly, remember these are men of the sea. They've been in lots of storms. They've been on the Galilee their whole life. The majority of these guys lived in that particular region. They knew what was coming up. Storms, I think, have been properly compared to the storms of persecution, adversity, and temptation. What do you mean? Not only are there storms that happen beyond our control without us and around us, there are storms that take place within us. There's issues that come up in our heart. Sometimes through persecution, through rejection, through problems, through, through strife, through difficulties, through losses, sometimes even through temptation. I, I believe most people don't even look at temptation like that, but it creates a storm that comes up within us and temptation rises up and tries to destroy us and it tries to capture our mind. And, and, and Jesus doesn't always automatically quell all those storms. They just don't go away every time. Sometimes we have to ride through the storm. And there's a lesson the Lord wants us to learn in that. But listen, I, I, what happens when, when, when they come is, and what we do in the, in the storm, that's the most important thing. In fact, when, he, when he's moving and, and, and we're in our hearts and lives and we're in the middle of these storms, it's important we discover that he is bigger and he is greater than the storm. But I really do believe if you've been living life at all, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When you, talk, when you, when you think about going through issues in your life, going through problems in your life, going through crisis in your life, when it's like there's surging storms that are beating you, they're beating at you emotionally, they beat at you mentally, they can beat at you physically, and they literally are like a war that's going on in your heart and in your mind. I know what it's like to go through those storms. Some of you know what it's like to go through those storms. You, you've wrestled at night when those things are just assailing your heart and assailing your emotions and mind. And you can't go to sleep and just, it's like a barrage of just wave after wave that's pounding against you and beating against you. The real storms of life. And I, I certainly believe that this seismic type of storm is something we ought to be able to relate to in our own lives because we all deal with those kind of things. Persecution comes. People reject us. What happens? Something breaks out inside us. Sometimes it's the same reaction of fear. Sometimes it's doubt. People say, well, you know, I'm going through this. Why? Why am I going through this? Why did not God love me? Doesn't he really care about my dilemma or my problem here? You know, why, what? I've tried to serve God and I've tried to love God. Maybe it's panic. All right. Sometimes it's resentment. People get, I know people get upset with God. God, why are you allowing this to happen to me? Those are storms. And what we do with those and how we handle those is very important. Now, at this time, these men are exhibiting very little faith. You know, in fact, the word is used timid and cowardly in, in, in different translations of Scripture. And they said, don't you care that we're dying here? They had to go wake Jesus up. You know, it's almost like I, I, I would be thinking if I were one of these and I don't think I would do anything any different. I'd probably say, don't you care? You know, you're in the boat, wake up, you know. It, it, the, the storm, you know, I'd be asking first of all, why doesn't this bother you? <laughs> why, why aren't you troubled by this? Why, why is it this getting on your nerves? It's killing us. And you're sleeping. You think it's a rockabye boat. <laughs> it's a storm. Don't you care that we're dying here? I won't ask you to raise your hand, but I know a lot of you have been there. In fact, you may be there today and you're suffering with that same kind of thought. 
Uh, don't you see what's happening here? Are you asleep? Don't you, don't you understand what, 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 what's going on here? Don't you, don't you realize the, the issue we're facing, the problems that we're facing, the things that we're going through here? Don't you understand? It's a big deal. And I don't see any relief. And I don't see any answers. And I, you know, I, don't, I don't know what to do here. I, I can't control this issue. I, I can't change this storm. I, I don't know how to deal with this, this particular problem I'm facing. Don't, don't you care that we're perishing here? Don't you understand? Well, you follow the story. Apparently they got the lesson. Because you watch these men's lives and you see them later in their life over in the book of Acts where they're facing every type of problem, every type of persecution, lions, death, the fire, you know, and... and even when they're in the worst of the persecution, they get together and they're in a prayer meeting and they're not saying, don't you care about it, Jesus? They're saying, Lord, give us boldness. You hear what they're saying. You know what they're doing. You know how they're seeking to take our lives. Give us boldness that we can continue to be what you've called us to be. So you see that there's a lesson that was learned in that process and they learned that lesson well because when you study the history of these men other than Judas, you see these men going through every type of imaginable adversity and problem, imprisonments, stonings. I mean, they were beat to death. They were crucified upside down. Some were burnt in the fire. Some were boiled alive in oil. I mean, in oil. They went through crisis. Perhaps it was in this storm they began to realize some important lessons of what God was wanting to do and how he worked in their lives. And even though the storm would arise, it doesn't matter what happens with the storm. What matters is what we do in our hearts. Because adversity does come. And when it comes, this, this doubt comes in, this discouragement comes in. And sometimes people just rebel against God. Sometimes it's in the form of temptation, as I said earlier. It allures us and we have this, this desire for what is God forbidden, what we know God doesn't want, what we think we say we don't want. But yet we're overwhelmed in the middle of this storm. Impure motives. Passions that are wrong. Jealousy, hate immorality, lust, temper, anger, all these things can spring up in our lives when the storms begin to, to, to happen. These men are wise enough to make a decision to go wake up Jesus, who's probably awake anyway, just watching out the corner of his eye. You ever done that with your kids? <laughs> he knows what's going on. Scripture says our father never sleeps and he never slumbers. The Lord God knows what's happening here. Where do you run? Some people run for the exit when troubles come. I don't want to deal with this. Some people stick their head in the sand like the ostrich, you know, mentality. I, I don't want to think about that. No, 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 no. Go away, go away. Some people, some people run to drugs. Anesthetize myself, you know, so they don't feel anything. Some people run to, you know, down, down to the margarita bar. I've got problems. I need a drink. Give me a cold one. Please make it a pina colada. Give me a cold draft. Now, we kind of think that's humorous, but here's what the problem is. Most of our world is doing that. They don't run to the cross. They don't run to Christ. They run to some little temporary anesthetic. And I want you to know that no matter how often you run to that source, it will never resolve your problems. It will never deal with your issues. You might find some kind of temporary emotional release for the moment, but Anheuser-Busch will never do what Lord Jesus Christ can do. Amen. Not in a million years. Now, you ought to clap just to cover up your sin. <laughs> I know that's not popular. I know some of you probably get upset when I talk about things like that, but you need to hear me well. I love you. And I care about your life, and I care about the course of your life. But if you're the kind of person who has to pop a top every time a problem comes, you have not learned anything. Amen. And you, you've lost the essence of genuine spiritual character in your life. It's when the storm comes that character is proven. The storms, as someone well said, will either make us bitter or better. Amen. And if we run to the wrong recourse, we run to the wrong fountain, if we run to the wrong source, it doesn't make us better. We become deadened. We become uncaring. And we lose the, the sensitivity that God wants us to have in life. So what's your answer? I mean, where do you go? What do you do? Because storms come. It's life. It's part of life. We teach our children this. Problems are going to come. Everybody at school is not going to like you. Somebody's going to call you fat or ugly or make a comment about your color or whatever it might be. You're going to have those kind of crises. Like, what are we going to do? 
We're going to run to Jesus who receives us and loves us and heals us and helps us. Somebody else say amen. amen. I don't know what's the matter with you all today. <laughs> this is good stuff. Amen. What do you do when the trial comes? What do you do when the temptation comes? Well, I have nothing else to do. I just go do it. Where's character in that? You see, James tells us in James chapter 1 that trials and adversities and storms come to everybody, but those are the very things that develop proven character in our life. Now we can say we're men of character and women of honor and women of character, but if we're not running to the right source when these things happen, then we're not people of genuine character. Jesus, when called upon, can bring calm even while the storm is still raging. Isn't that, isn't that a glorious thing? That we can discover the very presence of God as the storm is raging just by going to him. Now the first thing he does is he rebukes him. But understand the rebuke of Jesus is not like the rebuke from the, you know, getting pulled over with a traffic ticket. He's not there to penalize you. Okay, you got caught. Here's your punishment. That'll be $175. He's there to instruct. He's there to point out what the real issue is. And to show you what the real problem is. And he's there to give you what you need to deal with the real problem. But so many people, it's kind of like, you know, the kid with the, the hand in the cookie jar. I got caught. Oh, no. What am I going to do? But God is in, in this situation here ministering to these disciples a lesson that obviously they learned well and were used and applied later in their life. He says, you're, the problem here is you're timid. And, and then he tells them, why are you so timid? Why are you so afraid? Because you have little faith. The problem was unbelief. In other words, we believe that maybe the world does have an answer. Maybe, you know, there is an answer down at the bar. Maybe there's a little solution from mama's little pill bottle. You know, maybe those are the solutions. Then they're not. Think about these, these guys. They're out on the water. There's no bar nearby. There's nothing in the ice chest. It's probably gone anyway. All right. They don't, there's only one avenue to run to. And sometimes we get to that place in our life, don't we? The only place to go is Jesus. That's not a bad deal. That's the best deal you'll encounter in your life when there's no other way to look but to the Lord. Have you tried that? What you going through? Well, you know, man, you wouldn't believe what I'm having to deal with. Where's Jesus in the middle of the storm? Have you run to him? Well, he might rebuke me. If he does, it's for your better. So you might learn something and you might grow from it and you might be instructed. And character can be developed in your life. Integrity can be established in your life. Christian maturity can be seen in your life. And abs absolutely the best part of it, Jesus can be seen in your life. These guys, remember, by the way, we said they're professional fishermen, remember? They, they knew the word of God. These were Jews and they were devout men. And they, if, if anybody should know this scripture out of Psalms 89, they, they probably should. Because it's their, their livelihood. I, I would bet, and we'll read this moment, that if there's scriptures in the verse that relate to you or your life or something unique, you know, my son's in the army, he's always sent, sending me warrior scriptures and stuff like that, you know, and battle scriptures and stuff. Well, he, re he recognized though because those are where, where he's at. You know these guys knew these passages. Oh, Lord God of hosts, who is like thee? Oh, almighty Lord, thy faithfulness surrounds us. <clears throat> thou dost rule the swelling of the sea when its waves rise, thou dost steal them. Because they've been in lots of swelling seas. Oh, there's another great passage in Psalms that the psalmist gives us, and, and it's the same kind of things. Those who go down to the ships and sea who do business on great waters. Well, that's these guys, wasn't it? They were fishermen. They do business on great water. They have seen the works of the Lord. They've seen his wonders in the deep. For he spoke and raised up a stormy wind and he lifted up the waves of the sea and they rose up to heavens and they went down to the depths. Their soul melted away. In other words, they saw these swelling seas and the waves crashing. Their soul melts away until something happens. They're reeling and they're staggering like drunk men. They were at their wits end and then, then, then they cried to the Lord in their trouble. And he brought them out of their distresses and he caused the storm to be still so that the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they were quiet. So he guided them to their desired heavens. I, I would certainly think if I'm a fisherman, I'll see a Galilee and a doubt, devout believer that I know these passages from the Old Testament. Well, they did the right thing, though. They did run to the Lord Jesus. 
And they did go to the right place to get the right answers and to get the needed answers. And when he gets up after speaking to them, then he rebukes the waves and there was an absolute calm. I love the word that's in, from the Greek language that, uh, for rebuke here that Luke uses a unique word. He uses the word uh, from the Greek language is, is the word for to muzzle, like you put a muzzle on a dog. You know, a dog may be just screaming and barking, making all kinds of noise. You put that muzzle on him, you don't hear him anymore. He shuts up. When Jesus rebuked the wind, the sea, he says he rebuked them both, the storm and the sea. They were instant, calm. In fact, it is perfectly calm. Now, I don't know about you, I've been in some storms, and when the storm goes away, the waves are still choppy. Everything's still chopping and popping and moving around. And those of you who've been on lakes and boats and stuff, you know what I'm talking about. It takes a while for everything to settle down. Unless Jesus is on the scene. Muzzles it. Be still. The waves are calm. The sea is, and it says the, it says the storm, the wind, the sea, went all calm. Perfectly calm, as the scripture says. It was taken care of. And it says they were amazed. The word ethymation is the word in the Greek language. It literally means, you know, they're just blown away. And what? They see, the, they see this supernatural Jesus, you know, whose simple words stop this thing. I mean, here's a storm. It's beyond anybody's control. You can't stop a storm. But here comes someone on the scene who speaks a word, and it's all dead calm. And literally, they are, I can't think of a better word than blown away. Sometimes, oh, they just blew me away. You don't have any idea. And for them to be blown away, they've already seen lepers healed. They've already seen people delivered of demons. They've already seen lame legs walk. They've already seen blind eyes open. They've seen an influence on the physical nature of men, but now they see a supernatural, I mean, this is taking it to the next level. A supernatural influence over all of creation. This is a demonstration that he, is, that he, the Lord Jesus, is God over all things. And they're, they, just, they just come undone. I mean, they're, they're just blown away by the whole thing. And so would you, so would I. I would hope that we just, wow. It, it's just mind-boggling. Mark's statement that, that, that along with their, this great amazement says, not only were they amazed, Mark adds this in Mark 4, he says, they were very much afraid. They were much afraid. In fact, they're more afraid of the one who had stilled the storm than they had been in the storm, is the idea that gives us here. Have we lost that mindset and that context about the glory and the might of God himself? Has God kind of just kind of been brought down to like a little human idol for us? You know, we don't worship idols anymore for the most part, you know, in our culture. We've done away with the, with the pagan images, at least in, you know, in Western world. But now we have these new graven images. They're mentally graven. This is the way I thank God. This is the God I serve. This is how I serve God. And we develop our own, our own religion. Oprah Winston said, you know, I think it was her who said, you know, well, I just kind of combine everything and just have my own. That's, that's idolatry. It's serving a God of your own image. Serving a God of your own imagination. And that's how people can live the way they live without any care about spiritual things, the word of God, the will of God. They do whatever they want to do because they've got to know their own little mindset. They, this blows away all their little preconceived notions about God. Bam, it's gone. They've just seen something that's earth shattering. I mean, it's just, just it's beyond definition. What has just happened so much so that they're, well, let's just use a common vernacular. They're freaked out. I mean, not, oh, that's weird. No, they're really freaked out. They, they're just, I mean, they're, come, they're coming apart. It's, I mean, it's, Job kind of gives the idea. In, in the book of Job in chapter 42, Job's kind of given God this, uh, in, in 41, 42, his explanation about how, how good he is and all he's done and how he serves God and loves God. And then God goes, follows that with, let me tell you who I am. And Job just melts. He said, I, I've heard of thee by the hearing of the ear. But now my eyes see, see. Therefore I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. I thought I was something. When I look at you, I'm nothing. I thought I had arrived. I'm not even near. I haven't even left the station, much less got where I'm going. 
We, do we see God in that way? I, I think when we start getting this perception of God, then we can't be so easily drawn back to our sin and our fears and our doubts and our bitterness and our pitiful little ways that we can be even with each other. Amen? When we see this mind-blowing, awe-inspiring, incredible, supernatural, filled with power, and the only word to use is, is, is a good Bible word, terrible. He's a terrible power in God. You think you, you can witness some great physical forces and powers from storms in the world. Hey, where do you get a hold of God's power? I mean, on Mount Sinai, God's speaking, and there's lightning, and there's thunder, and there's clouds up on the mountain. So much so, everybody on the bottom of the mountain, the people of God, they're scared to death. In fact, they'd go to Moses and say, we don't want to talk to him. You go talk to him for us. <laughs> they were frightened. I think that somewhere we have made Jesus such a buddy, and he is, by the way. I don't want to doubt whatsoever the fact or downplay. He is my friend, and he is my brother, but he's also the Lord of glory. He's the Lord of glory. And he's the God of power and might and majesty. And yes, he's the God of compassion. He's also the God of judgment. Well, you just read through scripture, you see people's response. Isaiah, when he had that great revelation of God's glory filling the temple, he said, you know, woe is me. I'm ruined. That's what the New America says. I'm just ruined. <laughs> I saw the Lord. I'm ruined. King James says, I'm undone. I'm just getting honest, isn't it? Yeah, I thought I was together. I thought everything was cool. I thought I was fine until I got in God's presence. I'm, pfft, I'm nothing. I'm a, I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King of the Lord of hosts. And I think that for dealing with issues and storms and trials, we need to look beyond the storm to see the glory, to see the great and mighty God, all right, who's more powerful and more majestic and more awesome than most of us have even begun to perceive. That's why when Isaiah has this kind of encounter, he's like, oh, <laughs> that song we sing a lot of times, I can only imagine. We can't even imagine. Amen. You know, well, I stand as well. No, you can't. Don't even, hey, I think it's going to be like Isaiah. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> undone. I think Bill Stafford says that means half baked. Most of us are. I'm undone. And Daniel is, is another illustration of this in Scripture. Daniel heard from God, behold the Lord. He testified, no strength was left in me. My natural color turned to, to a deathly pale, and I retained no strength. I heard the sound of the words, as the, as the sound of, uh, heard the sound of his words, and I fell into a deep sleep on my face with my face to the ground. Some of y'all hear the sound of his words on Sunday morning, go to sleep, but that's not the same. All right. I just... I got God's presence. I just came like a dead man. I just, you know, what, what, what's left of me? What, I, have no, I have no excuses. I, I have no rationale for my life. I, I have no reasons when I thought I had reasons. I, I had justifications for my sin and my selfishness. I, I got nothing. You're too big. You're too mighty. Peter saw Jesus miraculously. We preached on this one of the first miracles we preached on. What he said, Lord, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. He saw this miracle. All right. Now, this is a different deal. Not only now has he seen this, this miracle. I mean, before, you know, you might write off, Jesus just had a fishing report or something. So I'm cast out time fish are starting to bite now. But now, there's, there's no way you can explain this deal. There's no way you can rationalize and justify that Jesus could have said, now, stop, boom, like a muzzled dog. It's just not going to, it just it doesn't fit within the context of human thinking. But that's God. He's not going to fit in your little finite box because he is the infinite, infant God. God, 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 God. All right? It's bigger than us. The Apostle Paul on his road to Damascus when he says, I just fell on the ground. Even though my eyes were open, I couldn't see a thing. Lord. He hadn't even met Jesus. Lord. He knew who it was. Nothing is as terrible and as mighty and big and awesome and even frightening to the human Psyche is the very presence of this terrible and awesome God. We serve a mighty God. And we've got to get back to realize that. And when we do, the pouting goes out. The whining goes out. 
the excuses, the rationalizations, the justifications. Can we keep before ourselves a mighty God? Can we learn how to practice in our, in our daily life the presence of this mighty God? That he is, he is there. He's a great and mighty God. There are some lessons. We'll close one. It's just this. God is terrible in might and power. And by the way, that means he doesn't need your advice Amen. or your opinion or for you to tell him what time it is and what time to start and what time to finish and what time to do the miracle. He doesn't need any of that. He's, he is the ultimate I am. He is so much. Jesus, even in human form, God in the flesh, when they came to arrest him in Gethsemane, whom do you seek? He said, Jesus of Nazareth, he said. And he makes this declaration of deity, all right? It's a Hebrew declaration. I am. Nobody says that but God. And when he says it, they fell back as dead men. Undone. In other words, if Jesus hadn't let him get up, they wouldn't have got up. If he hadn't let him arrest him, they wouldn't have arrested him. He's just big God. He's just powerful, holy, supernatural God. Hey, and the thing about it is, that God loves us. And beyond that, he's committed to us. It's almost like Jesus said, oh, you, you have a little faith. You've just seen everything I've done in the last year and a half. You've seen the dead raised. You've seen the blind see. You've seen the lame walk. You've seen the leprosy depart from people. You've seen demons come. You know, I'm in the boat. That's enough. Do you think that I'm going to let you die? And by the way, if I do let you die, that's graduation. Amen. <laughs> that's, that's what we're all destined for, amen? That's why Jesus died, so we could be with him forever. So praise God. Got a ticket home through the storm. We'll get there. Why are you afraid? He's committed to you. The Bible says, he which began a good work in you, he will perform it. Thank God for that. You need to remember that, and you need to remember it often. The last point is this. You press in on the storms. Sometimes he muzzles it, sometimes he doesn't. The disciples went on to learn but when he did muzzle this that they didn't have to worry about whether he did or didn't. That they could face every storm now that was before them knowing that Jesus was in their boat, in their life, and he was committed to them. And even if they had to face that final wall and valley of death, it would hold no sting. It would simply be a doorway into the very presence of God. That's the best news anybody will ever tell you, folks. And I hope you receive it. I need to be often reminded of this, as well as you. But that's why we preach. And that's why God's given us his word. But I would say, whatever storm that you're facing, it's time to man up and face it. And realize that Jesus is bigger than the storm. So you don't have to run. You don't have to run back to yourself, back to your sin, back to the world, back to your worries, back to your fears. You run to the cross. You keep running to Jesus. And every time the wind blows and the sea rises around you, you keep pointing your life towards him. And you keep moving towards him. You will get where you're going. And where you're going is Christ-likeness. Where you're going is spiritual maturity. Where you're going is life. Where you're going is peace. Where you're going is fullness. Where you're going is joy. Where you're going is satisfaction that only God can give you. Thank God for the storms when they come because it's in the storm we discover him. But have the wisdom, whether fearful and timid and afraid in the moment like they were, at least have the wisdom to run to Jesus. Embrace the cross. Would you stand? With our heads bowed, Father, in the name of Jesus.